uh, anyways, we shoved more chairs in here uh, for Sundays, and now you guys are spread out further. <laughs> Love each other, man. Come on. <laughs> anyways, hey, we are in 1 Samuel chapter 26 tonight. Why don't you guys go ahead and turn there. 1 Samuel chapter 26. If you don't have a Bible, it'd be very helpful if you grab one out of the back there because we're going to be covering two chapters, 26 and 27 tonight. And uh, we are traveling through the saga of David's life. And David's life is crazy. But just for you guys to, to understand that, you know, one of the things as you look at David's life is his situation really stinks, you know. And, and now he's dragging around wives with him, too, through all this craziness. And then he's got 600 men that came out who were in trouble. And they're his mighty men, his army, as it were. And and uh, he's just traveling around, and he's responsible for all these people all the time, and he still continues to serve the Lord, okay? He doesn't do everything perfect, as we know, but uh, he still does continue to serve the Lord. And I tell you what, sometimes we're just like at the first, first problem, it's like, <laughs> gotta stop, can't serve the Lord anymore, you know? <laughs> or, or we have all kinds of excuses, but he was on the run, and he continued to protect and do what God uh, created him in one sense to do is, is to protect, to shepherd the flock of Israel. And that's what he was called to do and anointed to do. He wasn't waiting for some future time to do it either. He wasn't king yet. He was anointed to be king. This bad king Saul, even though he was a horrible king, he got to rule for 40 years. Think about the grace of God on that man. Think about he had decades to repent from his foolishness, and he never did, you know. So, anyways, let's go ahead and, uh, and uh, pray, and we'll get into the teaching. Dear God, as we go through this Old Testament passage, Lord, may it be that, um, that we just understand the wholeness of your word. And as we look at this narrative, as we look at uh, what happened in David's life, we can learn the principles that you have for us today in the New Testament. Because David desired to serve you, and so do we. And so may we just glean uh, from what's going on in his life, Lord. Just teach us tonight uh, that we may live lives that just reflect you in our life, God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you haven't been with us, there was a time of judges, and these judges are really heroes, because the nation of Israel, they all did what was right in their own eyes. For 400 years, they were in the land, and God divided them up into manageable tribes, and they all got their land, and a couple times a year, they were supposed to come together so that they'd be unified spiritually, but they were supposed to have God as their king. And so they would do what was right in their own eyes. They'd rebel against God, and God would send someone to punish them. <laughs> uh, and and he, it's really bad when God sends an unbeliever to punish you, <laughs> right? Um, but that's what he would do. And then he would raise up somebody, a hero. And we know those as the judges. So the book of Judges is about these heroes, right? And again, mankind rebels. God raises up a man. His name is Jesus. And he's our hero, as it were. And, and so it, it's this model that, that God in the Old Testament wants us to understand. So when he sends the ultimate hero, that we would recognize him. And so that last judge, his name is Samuel. Samuel's very special as a judge because he's a rescuer of the nation of Israel, but he's also a prophet and a priest to the nation of Israel. He's a very wise man who heard from God from the time he was a little boy. He's a prophet of God, okay? And so the nation rejected God's government, and Samuel was a mouthpiece for God's government, and remember Samuel was upset with the people, and he says, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. You're my man. They've actually rejected me, you know, so anoint them a king, because they want to have a king like all the other nations around them, and so that's what he did. They, he anointed the people's choice. You know, you have the people's choice award, and that's what Saul was. He was good looking and, and tall and striking and initially he had a, a lot of good success but his character was not good. And so often we judge as men judge. We judge from the outside without knowledge. We judge by man's judgments not by God's judgment and that gets us in trouble every time. And so Samuel, excuse me, Saul 
was anointed king by Samuel. And Saul rejected God's leadership multiple times. And God says, he's, he's not going to be able to be king forever. Which doesn't mean he's going to, you know, cut off his reign early. What that meant was that his family was no longer going to be the kingly family. He's going to be rejected, okay? And uh, so God wanted to raise up his man. And so he goes to this obscure family, the family of Jesse, and, and he, uh, Samuel goes to them, and uh, he looks for David, and David is the, the uh, is that Hakata, um, which means the, the useless one in the family. Uh, if you didn't like one of your little brothers, you made them take care of the sheep so they'd be out of your hair. No one else wanted to take care of the sheep, right? And so here's David, the useless one, and that's the one that God chose. And so David, in man's eyes, as a little boy, was nothing. But in God's eyes, he was everything, you know? And, and, and so many of us um, care too much about what the world thinks of us. And, and we forget to read about what God thinks of us and what God wants to do with us and how much God loves us. And I tell you what, if you can unmoor, unmoor yourself from the world's position on your life, you're in a good place. Because the world's opinion of you might be horrible, but you can just keep on doing what God wants you to do, <laughs> right? And, uh, and have the blessing of God. Because what does man's opinion really mean? If God is for you, who ultimately can be against you? Well, everybody, right? But does it matter? It doesn't matter in the long run, right? I'm an animated, hydrated, sinful, mobile dirt clod is what I am. And I'm a sinner on top of that. And I'm trying to impress, and I really care so much about the opinion of other animated, hydrated, mobile, sinful dirt clods just like myself. Right? And, and we will go crazy just to get the applause of someone else just like us when we could care less about what God thinks of us, right? And, and so this is David. When David writes the Psalms that talk about just the Lord, against you, Lord, only have I sinned. He's not saying that he hasn't sinned against other people. What he's saying is, ultimately, God, you are my all in all. And if I please you, I'm pleasing everybody. If I sin against you, it doesn't even, nothing else even matters, you know? And uh, so that's David's attitude. And so... Saul was anointed king. He was told his kingdom is not going to last forever. And so God raises up this other young man, and David is not yet ready to be king. And so God puts all these things in David's life to prepare him to be king. He gets to work with the king. He's his musician. He's one of his personal assistants. Uh, David ends up killing Goliath and winning the hand of one of Saul one of Saul's daughters. So now he's his son-in-law. So now he's kind of in the royal family through marriage, right? And he ends up being one of his greatest, actually his greatest general. And so he's married to one of his daughters. And then Saul's oldest son, Jonathan, a man of great character, becomes David's best friend, <laughs> you know? And Saul becomes jealous of David, right? And he tries to kill David. He, he starts throwing spears at David, trying to kill him, even though he is literally his best citizen. He's his best asset as king. And so he's trying to, to kill him, even though he's this general that's bringing great victory and great glory to Saul himself. And so David ends up being a man on the run. He runs to the south, to the desert. He first runs to the north, and then he runs out to the west. And then he was running down in the south, in the deserts of Judah. Now, when you say the wilderness in Israel, you're not talking about forest, right? For us, we think, oh, you know, it's squirrels and trees and all this other stuff. No, it's a desert. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's a pretty parched land most of the year, okay? Now, so Saul starts to come after David. God provides men for David. And what happens is David is hiding out in this place that he would have visited as a kid with his sheep, uh, this place called En Gedi. It's a place of springs in the middle of the desert. A lot of caves there, and so they're hanging out there. It's their safe place. Saul goes down there to chase him. Saul goes into one of the caves to go potty, 
and uh, Saul is indisposed for a while, and David sneaks up on him, and he cuts off the hem of his robe, and, and he leaves. He doesn't hurt the king, but even then, David's heart is broken. You know why? Cutting off the hem of a king or someone in royalty is like ripping off the stripes of someone in the military. It's very disrespectful. And so his heart was broken even that he went that far. You know, he could have killed him, but, but, it, but he, he, he disrespects the king. And he still recognizes that it's God's job to remove that king and to make him king. It's not his job to do it. And so he's absolutely trusting in God. And so he had this opportunity. Well, what happens when he tells Saul, look it, I got a, a piece of the, the hem of your robe. And, and, and Saul, in a sense, repents, and he promises not to kill David's offspring. That's all he does, right? He, he promises not to kill David's offspring. You're, you're a better man than I. But the, the repentance wasn't complete, right? It wasn't, uh, it wasn't full. And so David didn't run back to serve with Saul. You know, David, in a sense, forgave Saul, but he wasn't going to be stupid. Right? We can forgive people, right? If, if you loan someone a, a certain amount of money and they go, oh, I promise I'll pay you back. You know, the Bible says to forgive that, that money, doesn't it? It's, and so the Bible's all about relationship, right? And everybody's going, who can I borrow money from in the church? No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, but what the Bible says is, People are more important than money. So given that chance, you choose the relationship with the person rather than hating them over the money. But are you going to loan them money again? No. Why? Wisdom. Wisdom would say, if I loan you money again, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm not going to put that stress in our relationship again. You know, that, that wouldn't be a good thing for us to do. I need to be wise. Now, if someone pays it back right away, whatever. You know, you loan them money or whatever, and, and that's fine. But, but, but in that case where they don't pay you back, you're wise. You've forgiven them. They have no debt towards you, but you don't put them in another place like that, right? And, and sometimes we as Christians don't always get that. Where, oh, the Bible says forgive, and we're supposed to act like it never happened. See, the Bible doesn't say forgive and forget. The Bible says forgive right? Because the more you try to forget something, what do you do? You remember it, right? <laughs> you know? And God is able to cast those sins as far as the east is away from the, the, the west. But, but the burden on us is to forgive. But we're also to be wise as well. Innocent and wise, the Bible tells us. And, and so, you know, if, if uh, you know, something happens in a, you know, just in a, a marriage and a, a man is beating his wife, and he repents. How many times are you going to sit there and let yourself be that, you know, that punching bag? You know, that, there, there needs to be actual things that you need to see. You can love that person, and, and you can have forgiven them, but you don't be stupid about it and put you and your children back into danger, right, uh, until there's actual things in place to keep that from happening, right? And so sometimes people fall into this, you know. Um, so David doesn't trust him. And Jesus at a point said, I don't entrust myself to men because I know what's in the heart of men. Does that mean he doesn't love us? No, his, his, his whole dependence was upon the Father. His, his whole existence, his whole direction was in the Father's hand. He was going to allow men to direct him. He was only going to allow the Father to direct him. Everything was put up against the Father. So, here is David. He's on the run. He's hiding out in these deserts and, uh, in, the, in what we would call the wilderness, okay? And, and then we see that, you know, Saul lives north of Jerusalem. David is living quite far south of Jerusalem. And we know he protected this man's sheep and, and this man's possessions, and, and then this man refused to feed his men. And David got real upset. The man's wife stood in. The man had a heart attack, and David married his wife. <laughs> so we, we, we see these things happening. But all these things are happening pretty far south of Jerusalem. Now we're starting verse 1. It says, Now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gebeah, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hahala, opposite Jessamine? And then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having three thousand chosen men of Israel with them. 
to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped at the hill of Hachala, which is opposite Jessamon, by the road. But David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. Verse 4, David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul had indeed come. David has 600 fighting men. He brings out 3,000, right? That's a, a, a quite an advantage for Saul. So the city of Ziph is the city of smelters. These people were loyal to Saul. They'd been keeping Saul informed about David. So David was near that area, and they're sending people to Saul to come down and get David. So they're calling him all the way into, into the south. Now David has a plan, and so he wants to find out what really is happening where Saul is camping. Verse 5, so David arose and came near to the place where Saul had encamped, and David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Now Saul lay within the camp with the people encamped all around him. And so you have this guy, Abner. He's going to show up quite a bit in, in the future of this story of David's life. And uh, Abner is Saul's top general, okay? Now Saul is camping in the middle of 3,000 warriors. This is important, right? Uh, when we used to go to Mexico, uh, when we were youth pastors in California, we'd go down to uh, Mexicali, and uh, we used to stay in this particular house that had a lot of cockroaches. And I think two of them would be, be able to carry away a full-grown man. I mean, these were big cockroaches. And, and so at first, we used to take the, the young adults down there about every other month, and then the high schoolers would take, or the high school ministry would take the high schoolers down there, and we had a competition in a bottle down there who could collect the biggest roaches, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, so the, I, the high schoolers actually won that one. But when we would go down with the, uh, the young adults, <laughs> Noreen did not want a cockroach to climb on her. And so she would lay there, and she would have all the girls <laughs> in camp around her. <laughs> but I tell you what, somehow, some way, those cockroaches would get in there. I mean, it was, it was crazy. But he's sleeping amongst 3,000 warriors, okay? Then David, verse 6, answered and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai the son of Zariah, the brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So Abishai is one of David's nephews, as well as um, well, a son of his, his older sister. Um, and Joab is mentioned there as well. Now, as as we saw that Abner was Saul's uh, general, you had Joab will in a future be David's general, or, or he pretty much already is, okay? And so Joab is the one we're going to hear about most, and he will eventually become the commander over all the armies of Israel as well. But you need to understand something. These are fighting men. These are not spiritual men. And it doesn't mean that you can't be a fighting man and a spiritual man. How do we know this? What is David? He's, he's the greatest ultimate fighter the Bible has, right? I mean, you, 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 think of, you, you think of Samson in that way, but mm, David is. And uh, uh, David killed many more Philistines, you know, and, and he, was, he was quite the hero. But he was also a very spiritual man, Okay. But these men are only physical in their thought. They just want to win, right? And so you need to be aware when you have people around you that, that God might have brought to you, but you know they might have advice that's bent in a certain direction. You just need to be aware. You need to be uh, aware of the source of your counsel, okay? And, and, and even within the church, just be aware of the source of your counsel counsel, right? And, um, you know, different people have different advice, right? If you run into someone that loves to teach Bible studies, everybody ought to teach Bible studies. If you run into someone that does missions, everybody ought to do missions. If you run into someone that does street ministry, everybody ought to do street ministry. 
and children's ministry and youth ministry. It's all the best, the best, the best, right? <laughs> you know, and so you, you, you need to understand people's perspective. But these men are about protecting David, but they are about the flesh, or excuse me, about the physical uh, uh, protection as well, okay? And so he loves his nephews, but his, his nephews will cause him problems in the future because they are always wanting to fight. And there's an interesting story later where you have Abishai just not giving up on a fight, and he ends up dying, you know, foolishly. He doesn't need to, you know. So anyways, verse 7, so David and Abishai come to the people by night. So they're sneaking into this camp with 3,000 fighting men. And there Saul lay sleeping within the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. Okay, so he has his spear there. Now, Saul is not very good with the spear, right? <laughs> he keeps on chucking it at David. He chucked it at his own son. He keeps on missing, right? But anyways, his spear's there. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. I got this, David. You see what I mean? It's just like, you know, what should we do, David? It's no. Let me strike him. Let me advise you, king. And we just need to be careful where our advice comes from. This man's a warrior, and that's what warriors do, right? Now, it's a lot like what they told him back in the cave when Saul went into the cave to go to the bathroom, but this time, he, you know, at, he, he's not leaving it up to David. Abishai is saying, let me do it, okay? But David said to Abishai, verse 9, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? This is God's chosen one. He also chose me, but he's no less chosen than me. I was chosen, he was chosen. We're in God's hands. God is going to take care of this, right? Uh, our world is very into marketing and self-promotion, right? And, uh, you know, you're in junior high and you like a girl and you want her to see you, right? But if you're a Christian kid, you ought to be thinking, if that's the girl for me, God will arrange it. And I can just chill out and relax and have a good time. Right? But we always want to take everything into our own hands. You're at work, and you want to, like, elbow everybody out of the way so your boss sees you, and you're the one promoted. But you know what? Do your job as unto the Lord, and God will raise you up in due time. You know what the Word of God says? You know? And um, you know, there, there, I felt called into full-time ministry from the time I rededicated my heart to the Lord at, at age uh, 24. And, and within that first week, I understood, God, you want me to pursue being a pastor or a missionary or something in that realm. And, and I understood that the whole trajectory of my life had changed. And so we were involved in Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, and I was relatively quiet um, compared to one of my best friends who I was discipling. He was very immature in the Lord, and I was discipling him. But man, that guy could talk. I mean, you know, one of those people that's just in the front all the time, and, and it's just their personality. They're not trying to do it. It's just who they are, right? And he's a very loud personality. Um, he's a senior pastor today as well. <laughs> but um, um, everybody noticed him. And uh, he got invited to a leadership conference, and I didn't get invited to it. And we'd been serving at this church for about six months. And I'm thinking, Okay, so I talked to my wife, and she just said, well, you ought to go talk to, you know, one of the assistant pastors who was overseeing what we were doing in ministry. And I go, you know what? If God's in this, it's God's problem. It's God's deal. I'm not going to go make a stink out of it. I'm just going to let God, you know, deal with this. I'm not going to force my way in. And um, so a day before the retreat, this guy, uh, the guy that was overseeing us in our service in that church, one of the assistant pastors, he comes to me and he says, Rod, I'm sorry, we forgot to invite you to this thing. You're on the list. We've even paid for you to go up to the camp, you know? And he goes, I am so sorry, my bad. And the coolest thing is, in that mistake, in that oversight, there was a lesson for me, you know? 
humble yourself, and he will lift you up in due time. Not in my time. I'm not due. I'm rod. <laughs> you know, due time is different than my time, right? So... So David is, uh, so it says in verse 10, David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him or his day shall come to die or he shall go out to battle and perish. I'm not going to do it, right? Now remember, there's a Nabal principle. What is the Nabal principle? David was so mad at this guy, Nabal, this fool. His name means fool. When, when he protected his people at, at great risk to his own people, David was protecting this group of, of men that were shepherds and they had supplies out in the field and people were trying to rip them off and kill them. And David was protecting this man's wealth. And when David said, hey, could you feed us? This man said, who are you, David, you rebellious punk, rebelling against the king, basically? And David gets all mad and he's going to go kill the guy. And the guy's wife has to step in. Even, even the guy's servants are going, no, he shouldn't have done that. That's bad because David took care of us. And no, this isn't a good thing, right? And so David went to his, uh, and so Nabal had Abigail, his, his wife, and she talked to David and she talked him off that cliff and David backed off. And what happened to this man? God took care of it. God took care of it. He didn't have to go slay this man. He trusted in God. So this is the Nabal principle. God will ultimately take care of your enemies. You know, the, the, the wrath of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God, does it? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, there's wars and justified wars and self-defense and all these other things, you know, but, but I'm just talking about your outlandish anger, right? Your wrath. I'm not talking about things where the Lord might lead you into something to do battle for someone, um, you know, to help them out of a bad situation. But I'm talking about just your foolish, headlong, I am angry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel better because I'm going to get you. And so David's going, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. And, and David has, has had a lot of time to think about this situation. I'm anointed king, therefore God's going to make me king someday. He's not going to force it, Okay. Trust God in every situation. So this time, David doesn't even see tempt seem tempted to harm Saul. You see that? What is happening? David is learning. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I'm not saying that you don't ever, you know, challenge someone that has ripped you off or whatever, but you don't do it in selfish wrath. You do it under the principles of God as God leads See what I'm saying? If God calls you to join the military, you're joining the military because God has led you to join the military. Not because you just want to go kill some sucker. <laughs> you know? That's not the right attitude when you join the military. So David is growing in maturity in the Lord. Peter, Peter's last words to us but were, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus jesus christ if you really think about that what does that look like how different would you look if every day you're growing in the grace and the knowledge of our lord jesus christ does jesus have the right to be angry with every single one of us and lop off our heads and squish us <laughs> you know because he's every bit God as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, isn't he? And he is completely righteous and perfect. Doesn't he give us the ability to breathe, the ability to communicate, the ability to live, the ability to enjoy these incredible gifts? I didn't create these wonderful gifts that God gave me. He created them all. And I get to, to enjoy them, and then I still sin against him, right? Right? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is upon me on my bad days. And even on my really good days, I'm still not good enough for God. Because even my righteous works, my perfect works, hands raised, worshiping God with all my heart, are filthy rags compared to God's righteousness. Aren't my righteous acts filthy rags before God? 
don't I need the filter of God's grace on me all the time? And so what do we do when we drive on our freeway in Corpus Christi? Idiot, I can't believe you're doing that. Well, you shouldn't do that the same way next year as you do this year. Why? Because you're growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And then you're so mad, you know, I just got a, 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 a message on Messenger about, you know, this couple that I know well. They're no longer here, but um, I know them well. And this woman just spits venom and tells me what an absolute idiot her husband is. I'm like, I ain't responding to that. Are you kidding me? You know, growing in the grace and the knowledge? Woman, how much grace do you have towards your husband? You know, like, wow. Do any of you have anything wrong with you that anybody else can pick at? <laughs> right? There's a few things. I mean, she should get the staff. There'd be a line a mile long just to, or not a <laughs> we'd have a, 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 a stack a mile high of things that the staff could say against me because I'm imperfect as, as their, their uh, pastor in this church. But grace, man, growing the grace. And the, so here is David looking at this king who's trying to kill him. And what is he doing? He's showing grace. Man, isn't this a, a man after God's heart when you see things like this? Now, he did stupid things, and in the future, there's still Bathsheba and all that story. And he's quite capable of doing stupid things. But I just realized I'm quite capable of doing stupid things, too. You know, it's like, okay, I decided, to, I, I decided sin was a bad idea, so I stopped. That'd be a nice statement to be able to make, right? But I still need the grace of God. And you know what? I need the grace of God from you as much as you need it from me, you know? And we need to be growing in the grace of God. How radical does grace look? More radical than any of us have attained yet, right? And so what does Peter say? Keep growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here we have evidence my point is, here we have evidence that David is growing, okay? I will not kill him, <laughs> right? So what does he do? He takes a spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and then they got away, and no man saw or knew it or awoke, for they were all asleep. And who gets the credit for them being asleep? We were so quiet. Yeah, that was so cool. They're not high-fiving each other and fisting each other and chest-bumping each other. Yeah, we snuck in there. Who do they give the credit to? The Lord. And, and again, that's a, that's a whole other study in itself. So he recognizes that, uh, that God allowed them to do this. Now, what is the difference between this time and last time as well? Last time, David goes in and he basically rips off his stripes, his military stripes, because that's what the hem of your robe, you know, you'd have, you know, your chevrons here, you know, whatever your rank is, but they used to wear it on, on their robes, okay? This time, all he does is take the spear and the jug. He's not going to disrespect Saul in that way. So, so it, it is different. You think, well, he stole it. He, he's going to give it back. <laughs> you know, he might spit in the water or something. I don't know, but <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I might. <laughs> I don't think David did. But David went over, verse thirteen, to the other side and stood atop of a hill afar off, a great distance between them. And David called out the people and to Abner the son of Ner, saying. Do you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who are you calling out to the king? Now, we're going to see. Last time, it was in the cave, and the king was way more exposed. And he kind of challenges the king, and not too many people understood absolutely what happened in that cave. This time, he's going to publicly challenge the king, okay? So he shouts out, he wakes them up, he shouts out to his general. Verse 15, so David said to Abner, Are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why have you then not guarded your lord the king? For one of the people came in to destroy your lord the king. 
This thing that you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and his jug of water that was by his head. Wow. So too bad we couldn't hurt hear their tone. <laughs> you know, like, ooh. Verse 17. Then Saul knew David's voice and said, Is that your voice, my son David? It is his son, right? Son-in-law. But all of a sudden. And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Why does my lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in my hand? Now, therefore, please let my lord the king hear the words of his servants. And if the Lord has stirred you up against him, let him accept an offering. So, what David is saying, if you're on God's mission, I will be your offering to God. God will make sure that you catch me, right? But then he goes on to say, but if it is the children of men, if it's from a human idea, he says, May they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. So David isn't allowed near the tabernacle, is he? David isn't allowed to offer up offerings to the Lord, is he? And he's being pushed out, and the idea is it's man's vengeance, not God's plan. And so that's what he's saying. He's challenging him. Verse 20, so now do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Now, if you hunt partridge here, you might use dogs, you know, to flush them out, and then you shoot them with a you know, 12-gauge shotgun. That's real fair. Um, <laughs> but back then, when they would hunt these birds, they would chase them for, until they tired, and they tired fairly quickly. And then they'd, they'd hit him over the head with a bat. What's that? Yeah. And you hit him over the head with a bat, you know. So he's going, this is how you're hunting me. You're trying to wear me down, you know. And, and, and you're, 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 this is ridiculous. This is stupid. What are you doing? Okay. So I want you to think about it. Saul is going overboard. Saul is the king. Saul has a budget. Saul has men. He has 3,000 men away from their jobs, away from their fields, away from their homes, their children, their families, to kill God's anointed. Isn't that crazy? The, the, the madness that Saul is coming after David with is just foolish. Every time he goes out, he goes out with 3,000 men against 600 to kill David. And ultimately, he's fighting against God's will. Listen, don't expend energy fighting against God's will for you. Just don't do it. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Verse 21, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. Now he is playing the fool in front of his men and publicly. And David answered and said, verse 22, Here is the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and get it. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let the life, my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, may you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also shall prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. Now again, this is public. And I think his plan is to show all of Saul's 3,000 men. Wow, Saul is taking us all the way out to this God-forsaken place to kill David, and David's a good man. Right? You, you think about what David did with grace and kindness. If he had just fought against Saul, these men would have went back home and said, David, he's trying to kill our king. But what does David do? 
David wins the heart of these 3,000 men. Later on, David's going to be their king, isn't he? It's going to be easier for him to be brought in as king because these men will remember how David responded and how David acted. And again, the first time he confronts Saul, it's at a small level, you know, and God is starting to make it more public. And so it starts off small between David and Saul and David and Saul and Jonathan and David and Saul and Jonathan and, and, and the general in the cave. And now it's David, you know, and, and Saul and all these generals and 3,000 fighting men are hearing what's going on. And, that, and that's what, how we're supposed to handle it in the church. Matthew chapter 18 says, you know what, if someone has offended you, you don't go on Facebook. It doesn't actually say that in the Bible. God knew Facebook would happen, but he didn't write about it in the Bible. Um, but what I'm saying is you don't go gossip about someone behind their back right? You go to that person directly. How many of you guys like it when you make a mistake and you're able to save face because someone has just approached you, you're able to say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. You know, just accept my apology. And it's over. Isn't that how you want to be treated? And so that's how we should treat other people, right? And then it becomes bigger if, if the people don't respond. So here's Saul. He's out with 3,000 men, and it got bigger. Why? Because he's not responding. And so your sin eventually becomes large and public if you're not willing to repent. And that's how the Bible has designed it. And so you need to understand David is learning every step of the way, and we can see evidence that he's learning. Saul is not, right? Right? There's a book, and if, as I mentioned it, I don't know how many we have, how many copies we have. We should probably get more, but it's called The Tale of Three Kings. And it's not like this big theological book to read, but it is a very interesting book as it talks about leadership. Because you have Saul as a king, as a leader over people, and how he leads. How does he lead? By threat, right? What kind of leader is that? You guys ever had leaders like that? You ever had teachers like that that just yell at you all the time? And then you had another guy that had a lot of leadership behind him, and he actually threw David out of Jerusalem. It was his own son. His name was Absalom. And he didn't lead by threat, but he, he led by manipulation, whispers, uh, 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 getting turning people against King David, Right? So one guy's just threatening, the other guy's just manipulative. How did David lead? By example, didn't he? He followed God, and, he, and, and, and if he was going to follow God, people would follow him. And that was his attitude. You know, and so you, you, have, you have bosses or you have commanding officers who can manipulate the situation to try to get you to do your job. Or you have officers that are just in your face and they think you're an idiot and so they just try to force you to do your job. Or you have commanding officer or bosses or overseers or managers who care about you as a person and want to see you do the best that you can for your sake. And that's the person you want as a boss, isn't it? We had Colonel Sassenrath attend our church for about five years. He ran the Army Depot. And when he, re when he retired, we went to the ceremony, and there was tears. Because that man served everybody that he ran into. And he commanded the whole uh, Corpus Christi Army Depot. You know, he would, he would walk into this church. He would pick up a clipboard and just start getting, getting to work. You know, he would get stuff done. And as soon as he came in that door, he goes, I'm not a colonel, I'm a servant of Jesus. <laughs> you know, that's a high, honorable place is to be the servant. You want to be great in God's kingdom? What do you do? <clears throat> you be the servant of all. The best husbands are servant leaders. You know, wives are thinking, yes, husband. Well, he's your servant, but you're not his leader. You're, you're his, he's, he's your servant, but you're not his master, right? And uh, that's how the attitude needs to be, and this is how David led. Chapter 27. David is teachable. That was the point there. Chapter 27, 1. And David said in his heart, Shall I now perish some, by by the hand, some day by the hand of Saul? 
Is there nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines? So Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. Then David arose and went over with 600 men who were with him to Ashish, the son of uh, Melch, the king of Gath. And so people say, well, David ran into the enemy's camp and, and uh, this was a really stupid thing to do. Was it a lack of faith? The reality is David knows that Saul will con come after him again. He knows that Saul's repentance wasn't complete. He wasn't going to trust Saul. He forgave him, but he's not going to trust him. So David runs into the enemy's hands where he's not going to have to just go bing, bing, bing and start running all the time. That's what he was doing. He had no solid place to live. He has, he has his family with him. He has these 600 men. They're starting to get families with him. You know, and he's got this following that's with them, and they are camping everywhere they go and dependent upon anybody around them. They can't have their own cattle. They can't do anything. So he's tired of this. So to this point, when Saul first became jealous of David, when? When David was a teenager and he killed Goliath, right? He got jealous of him, and he tried to kill him with a spear twice. Later, Saul asked David to be his son-in-law, and he says, I know what I'm going to do. To become my son-in-law, I'm going to send him into the enemy's camp, and he's going to have to collect 100 foreskins of the enemy. So what's he thinking? I'm going to kill him. But what does he do? He comes back. Here you go, king. I don't know why you wanted those things, but here you go. <laughs> Where's my wife? He wanted to kill him. Later on, Saul put a contract on David, and David escaped with the help of his wife. Now, Jonathan went to his dad, confronted his dad, and Saul tried to kill his own son. And he took a, he, even though he took an oath to not kill David. Next time they had a skirmish against a, a, a Philistine city-state, David had success, and what did, do? What, what did Saul do? Tried to kill him again. Saul sent assassins to kill him again. Saul hid with Samuel in Ramah. Saul sent assassins again. The next time Jonathan confronted Saul about David, Saul threw another spear at Jonathan, his own son. Saul found out that David had received help from the priests at Nob, and what did he do? He killed all the priests at Nob. When David rescued the city of Kaliah from the Philistines, Saul came out to kill him again. When David was in the wilderness of Ziph, Saul hunted him down until there was a skirmish that he had to deal with and he had to leave. Then David hid it in Gedi and Saul showed up and tried to come after him again and that's when David cut his robe and now Saul shows up in the wilderness once again to kill David. Is David a fool to get out of the land of Saul? I don't think so. Would you believe that Saul said, I won't hurt you anymore, come home, my son. <laughs> I don't think I would. But again, we are to forgive, but we're not to be stupid. Okay? So David had tried to hang out with the Philistines before. The problem was they knew David well. And they didn't know that David was on the run from Saul. They didn't know that they were enemies. And so David didn't have a very good time there the first time. Now, everybody in the area knows that Saul is trying to kill David. It's obvious. After that list I read, everybody knows. The greatest general is trying to, or the king is trying to kill his greatest general, his own son-in-law, his son's best friend, right? So now he goes to the Philistines, and he's thinking, I can go there, and I, don't, I won't have to run all the time. And so this, this Philistine uh, king, and, and they had these city-states, and so they weren't always in communication so one city state might attack israel and the other one doesn't or whatever and it's been some time since david was po possibly a thorn in their particular flesh but also this king is thinking we can't kill this guy and now he wants to be on our side so they're they're bringing him they're going okay well saul's trying to kill you and now you're an enemy of saul so an enemy of my enemy is my friend and so this king is thinking, we can't do anything about you, and now you want to join our team? That works for me. 
And so David comes into his land. So David dwelt with Achish, Achish at Gath, and he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam, and the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the Carmelites, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. Now, Saul sought him no more because he promised David or because he was in the enemy's camp. Enemy's camp, right? That's what it says. It says he's so, because David moved into Philistine territory, he didn't, he didn't try to kill him anymore because he couldn't get at him. Then David said to Achish, if I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I might dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? Now, this is very smart on, on uh, David's part because he doesn't want to be there right under the king so the king could change his mind and kill him, right? And he didn't want to be under the watchful eye of the king. So he says, I'm on your team. Just, just give me a place where we can dwell with our people. Okay, I'm, I, I won't attack you directly. And so Ahach gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now, that, that town was originally uh, belonging to the tribe of Simeon, but there was, uh, they didn't have possession of it at that time. The Philistines had, had that city, and so they got that city back for Israel. Now, it would belong to Judah, uh, the southern part of Israel, permanently. Verse 7, Now the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided the Gershites Ger, uh, and the, the Grizzlyites <laughs> and the Amalekites. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from old as you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. Uh, so there's these places, these city-states that were enemies of Israel. And so you don't have like CNN hanging around all the time, right? So he would go out and attack the enemies of Israel, but he would tell the king, as we're going to see, that he was attacking Israel, like I'm going against these guys. But what he's doing is he's actually serving his future people while he's in the enemy's camp. And he has a really good place to come from because they're not expecting them to come from that direction, Okay. And so he goes after the Amalekites, and the Amalekites are a big problem to the Israelites, and, and he's, he's weakening them, okay? Verse 29, whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep and the oxen and the donkeys and the camels and the apparel, and he returned and came to Achish. And then Achish would say, where have you made raid today? And David would say, against the southern area of Judah or against the southern area of of uh, the Jerahim lights or against the southern area of the Kenites. And so even though he's actually, you know, fighting these other battles, you know, he's making the king think that he's, um, he's actually fighting Israel itself or Israel's allies. Verse 11, David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring the news to Gath, saying, least they should inform on us, saying, thus David did. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, He has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. And so he figures he'll become known as a traitor to Israel, and therefore he will have an ally. Now again, you know, as you read that, I think you're thinking, Oh my gosh, he killed all the women and children. Listen, y you need to understand that God knows those that are his. And they're not going to die like, oops, let that one slip by. He knows those that would choose to walk with God. The problem with children is they grow up to be adults and enemies of Israel. A and we think, well, that's harsh. But if Israel was allowed to be wiped out, no Messiah. What does that mean for us? No salvation, right? Because it was God's plan through this nation Israel to bring forth Messiah. And, that's, and, and so he protects the nation of Israel. And uh, so it's not like God is killing those that would receive him, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and allowing David to do so. And so that's not an accident. And, and you might struggle with it. I do. And, and it's okay. <laughs> I don't understand uh, the perfection of God 
and his ultimate plan and his knowledge like he does. And I just have to trust God when it comes to things like that. So often we look back in history and we think, oh, well, that's wrong because, blah, blah, but we don't live in history. And we don't know the bigger plan. We only know the, the short-sighted thing. But, but I think what you need to see here is David had every reason to get selfish and to live for himself, didn't he? God, you anointed me king, and here I am. I'm having to live in the enemy's land. I'm, I'm, I'm having to you know, do all this stuff and provide for all these men. Yeah, thanks a lot, God. Right? And that's our temptation, isn't it? To find every reason not to serve God. There was a, a woman, a good friend of mine, Ron Hint, up in uh, Houston, pastor of, of Calvary Chapel in Houston. Uh, his wife, for nine years, had cancer. And uh, nine years is a long time to have cancer. And uh, right before she found out she had this rare cancer that's really hard to, to fight, she was praying, God, give me, give me a ministry, an, an intense ministry where people really need. You, you see, she was running the women's ministry, and she was listening to all everybody, eh, complaining about their husbands and their kids, you know. And she was thinking, I want, like, like radical ministry. And then she got the diagnosis of cancer, and you know what she said? I now have a real ministry. And she, she would go in for nine years, guys, having chemo, operations, you know, transfusions, testing all the time. And she would go up to these cancer hospitals in Houston. And you can imagine what those, those waiting rooms are like. And she would go in there and she would just light up the place. This is my ministry. This is my mission field. You know, it wasn't, I'm mad at you, God. It was, God, you've given me a mission field. I don't like this. But man, I'm going to use it to serve you. I don't think David liked being on the run all the time and having the king against him. Of course not. But what was he going to do with it? Man, I'm going to live in the enemy's camp and I'm going to fight the enemies of Israel <laughs> while I can. He continued to serve the Lord even in crazy, devastating circumstances. You know? And... Um, Our lives can get so easy that we just forget to, to wake up in, in go mode, right? You know, it's like we want to wake up. And what, what's it called, a go bag, when you got to be ready on the spot? Is that, is that what it's called, a go bag? You know, so if you're in the military, you got to be ready to go, right? Um, if you're on certain jobs, you got to be ready to go, you know, get out there. You know, for me, I leave wetsuits and surfboards in my car. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> my, the surf is good. Got to go. But uh, the point is, uh, we got to wake up because our lives can be so easy that little things tend to stop us from that day serving God. Right? But saying, no, I'm going to go. I want to go. Uh, I listened to a teaching just just uh, last night on my way back down from dropping my daughter off up, up at Baylor. And um, is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And it says, those who are married should live, because the time is short, those who are married should live like they're not. Those that are, that are mourning like they're not mourning. Those that are rejoicing like they're not rejoicing. And, and what is he saying? He's saying this. Your life is not about your fulfilling yourself in marriage if you're married. Your life is about God and glorifying God through that relationship. It isn't about sucking that relationship dry. It's about glorifying God first, and the residue of that is you're actually going to enjoy your spouse. But if you try to force your spouse to please you, you're going to be unhappy, you know? And other things that we do, it's like, so we have a victory in the past, and we rejoice. And, and, and that victory is our focus. But the problem is, when you have a victory, it quickly goes behind you, doesn't it, as you move forward? And so is it, is it, can you run towards God while you're looking backwards at this victory? 
do we just talk about the things we did 20 years ago or does God have things for us to do tomorrow or today or mourning you know we do mourn but we don't mourn as those that don't have hope and sometimes mourning can just cast an anchor and stop us from moving forward in, in the Lord you know and, and I tell you what man my mom was such a great example when we buried my dad the very next day she was sitting in a waiting room as a man's wife was getting a biopsy she's serving that next week she had a Thursday night Bible study in her house with about 15 people and she kept on doing that Thursday night Bible study she still did her hospital visitations she, my mom would provide and organize all the food for every funeral and the church I went to was about a 3,000, 4,000 member church the one I grew up in in California and had been there for close to, to 170 years my mom was a member for 70, 78 years of that church. And, and, and for years, she had been helping with funeral stuff. You could imagine, Mama, I'm done with funerals. No, that's not what she did. She knew what these ladies were going through when they lost their husband. She, she, she felt for these widow, widowers who lost their wives or these others that lost children. She went through a lot of pain in her life, and she said, you know what? Pain is not an excuse not to serve the Lord. Pain makes me more qualified to serve the Lord. Right? And, and so, much, so often it becomes so much about us. I was telling the staff today, I have lived a radical life even though I haven't taken a vacation for myself, any major vacation for myself. Every vacation I take is a mission trip. Every, every summer vacation my family ever took was always around a pastor's conference. You know, but the best memories my kids have are Jamaica, Peru, Mexico, street witnessing, Hallelujah Night Outreach. Is that a horrible life to live for your kids? To watch you sell out for your for your God? You can take them to Disneyland, but what's gonna give them better character? Disneyland? Or a trip to Peru or a trip to Mexico to the orphanage down there? What's gonna give them a better understanding of who God is you know it's like man you can't out give God you know when I signed up for this 28 years ago for for ministry my life stopped being mine it belongs to everybody else and I'm in it for the long haul so I don't let you know my whole life be torn apart you know I got to have some alone time with me and God and me and my wife I'm not talking about that but if I look at my schedule, it just, it just piles up. You know, last summer, it was two weddings. Our vacations were two different weddings, <laughs> you know, to, 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 to go to and, and perform. And, you know, it's just like, but the thing is, awesome times. You cannot outgive God. David was the cast out one, and he wrote psalms in the wilderness. He wrote songs to God, learned how to play instruments, and worship God in the wilderness. What a bummer for David. No way, man. He got to camp, and he got to become a warrior in the wilderness. Oh, man, I got to live be with some sheep. It's like, no, man. Is there a lion out here I can kill? Little boy, man, loving that stuff. Then what does he do to get to do with that? He gets to kill a, a giant. You know? And how much of the Psalms do we have with David living out in the wilderness? And he whines, and God answers his whining, doesn't he? God, why do the unrighteous flourish and I'm dying? You know, he does that. But by the end of the psalm, he's praising God again. You can't outgive God. What does God say? If you seek to find your life, what happens to your life? You lose it. Basically, in our vernacular, if you're selfish and you're just trying to get whatever your selfish little life wants, you're going to be empty. You're going to have nothing at the end of your life. But if you surrender your whole life, and I'm talking about living like Jesus, right? Like willing to die for other people. Then what do you do? You gain life. Our church changed when, we, when, when God told us, get behind Hannah Overton and let the world hate you and think you're stupid and write horrible things and give you death threats and scratch your cars in the parking lot. That transformed our character to this day in this church. We're punks, man, for God. Because so what? You know? I remember at first, oh, the newspaper wants to talk to us. 
of the newspaper people show up, and I go, wait a second, let's talk about you for a minute. Well, sir, I'm not here to talk about me. I go, well, if you want anything out about it, let's talk about you. And I would interview the newspaper people and share the gospel with them before they ever got to the questions for me. Because I'm like, you're not intimidating me, and if you don't want to do this, you can go away. It's okay. You know? I mean, God, God, you, you step into a big pile of, of what the world would call poop. And what does the Lord do? He fertilizes you with it. <laughs> you know? And he makes you better through it. And God tells you, test him on this. You can't outgive God. And you know what? You know, people say, well, you, you know, I, I was drugged as a kid. Drugged to church, you know? And that's, you know, my kids were raised in church. And, you know, we were the last ones out of the building every time. And you know what? My kids want to go and live on the mission field right now. Man, what a bummer. Guys, you sacrifice everything to God. Your marriage, your friendships, your habits, your vacations. You're everything to God. God gave everything for you. We try to give it all back to him, and he's just going to give you more out of it. What a bummer to have purpose in your life. Guys, Disney World, yeah, I love amusement parks. But give me the choice between a mission trip and amusement park, I'm going to choose the mission trip, right? And, and, and we can, you know, just fill up on this, or we can, we can just surrender everything to God and see what he has for us. What could God do w- with the 200 people in this church if we all just surrender to God? Make a big noise, wouldn't it? In heaven. Earth might think we're stupid. And that's okay. Animated, hydrated mobile dirt bags that sin and so why do we care well we care about the person to know God but we shouldn't care about their opinion of, of us consider the source do you want God's approval or do you want man's oh Lord please make us that place where we just get sold out people. I could care less if we shrink to be 100 people. If we got people on fire, I am a blessed man. You know, I just want us to be on fire. I don't want the world to say, oh, what a successful guy. I'll buy his book. I don't have a book, by the way. But, uh, you know, what a successful guy. You know, we'll interview him. No. I want God to be blessed with this body. No matter what. You know, and it just takes God to take it all. You can't outgive God. He'll always give you back more. I'm a blessed man, not because I've tried to bless myself. I'm a blessed man because I've surrendered. I've given in. I've given up. Oh, that's so great of you, Pastor. When is given up something great? Right? When is being counted a fool to be something great in God's kingdom, something great in the world? It's not surrender humble yourself in the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up in due time right and uh, oh I'll stop let's pray (laughs) dear God may it be Lord that this church would be on fire and Lord our Wednesday night people Lord we, we love the Old Testament we dig in we we want to know you more And Lord, if it takes just starting here and affecting Sunday morning, then Sunday morning affecting the kids and the kids affecting their schools and us affecting our work, Lord, and other churches and fellowship. And Lord, just do a work. May we be sold out for you, we pray, God. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.